Frankville, Alabama. I don't recognize a whole lot of insight there in your eyes. You probably have never heard of it unless maybe you remember I've told you a little bit about it before. It's a little community of 460 people in the southwest corner of Alabama on the Tom Bigby River. It was settled by some of my ancestors. If you go there in the graveside at Frankville Baptist Church, there are a lot of tombstones with the name Grenade there. In fact, Frankville Baptist Church is a big part of my spiritual heritage. It was there a long, long time ago in the 1920s when the church was starting and there were meetings sporadically that they had to have guest preachers come through. And the only time they could hold church would be when someone showed up to preach, just happening to come through. Now, I've never been a member of this church. In fact, I've never attended a service there. And yet, it's important because back in 1920, there was a deacon there. His name was Turner Johnson. Turner Johnson thought this church should meet every week and we need to start praying that God would raise up a pastor for the church and that God might call one of our children to the ministry. There was another deacon there. His name was Joseph Napoleon Grenade, my great-great-grandfather Knapp. He decided that this prayer needed to be more specific. So he began to pray that God would call one of his children into ministry. But none felt the call. They too became farmers like most folks in that area. But his grandchildren heard the call a generation later. My father, his brother Charles, and another one of my uncle's gains, and three of their cousins all went into full-time Christian ministry. One of those was his cousin, Audrey Pugh Grenade. Audrey had a spinal issue. He had a tumor, and he was bound to a wheelchair. And everyone said, you can't preach. And he said, watch me. And he pastored several churches throughout South Alabama, preaching out of a wheelchair. They had to cut a pulpit down to where he could preach. And yet he was a powerful preacher. Today in my generation, there are dozens who are in the ministry and uh, there are those below me that are still preaching. These who, these deacons back in 1920, prayed that God might raise up. You see, that's how God works. From generation to generations, God is faithful. In the scripture that we encounter this morning, Paul is writing to Timothy, his beloved son in the ministry. They were not directly related, but Timothy had become like a son to Paul. And he writes to Timothy, and he wants to encourage him as a pastor. And he says to him, remember your grandmother Lois. Remember your mother Eunice. How they had great faith. Let that inspire you. Now, we do not inherit our faith. Each of us must come to Christ on our own, our own. We must make that decision to follow Christ. But that faith is shared from generation to generation. The story of Christ and what Christ can do in our life must be passed on from generation to generation. You see, we pass along to our children and grandchildren those traits that we have, whether they are good or bad, we pass those along. So we should focus on our faith. We should share the stories of our faith journey. We should call our children to faithfulness. We should live lives such that they too might see and believe. You see, it's not just pastors who have this generation-to-generation -generation story. I remember going to one of my previous churches, and the first week I was there, I was walking through the hallways, and there was a man sitting at a desk in the children's building. I said, what are you doing? And he said, I am the children's 
secretary. I record the kids that are here and I reach out if we haven't seen them and I call them and make sure that they know that we have Sunday school for them and they're loved and welcomed here. And I said, how'd you get this job? He said, well, my father was a children's Sunday school secretary. And when he got to where he couldn't do anymore, he just told me I was going to do it. I said, well, how did he get that job? He said, well, his father, my grandfather, was the children's Sunday school director, and our family makes sure that this job is done in our church. And I thought, how wonderful. A couple weeks later, his sister came to see me. She had some complaints about things in the church. I was too new to know, even know what she was talking about, but I soon learned that this was her role in the church was to point out things that weren't quite right. She started with this. She said, my grandmother was the organist in this church. And my mother was the WMU director and I have some things to say. About the third time she visited and told me that, I stopped and said, I just got one question. I understand the things that you don't think are right here. And I understand that your grandmother was an organist and that your mother was a WU director, but what exactly is it that you do here again? To which she turned and walked out of my office, not too happy with me. You see, in that same family, they had both been exposed to generations of faithfulness. One heard the call and said, it is now my turn, my duty, to step up and make sure that God's work is happening. Where another didn't see that and only saw ways to complain. What is it that you are passing along to your children and your grandchildren? This is Jubilee Sunday and we celebrate those who have been in our midst those who have been faithful members for over 50 years or who nine, are nine years old or over. We celebrate you and we thank you for your stories. And we need to share those stories. In fact, I asked in the letter that I sent out to celebrate these people a few weeks ago that you might share some stories with me. And I love the stories that you have shared. The Brindles sent me in some stories. They're here up front. They were baptized in the old building downtown. Paul used to come with his father, Thad, early on Sunday mornings that they might light the coal furnace on those cold winter days that the church might be warm. Paul's dad was a craftsman, and he made a very special mirror for our church. You probably can't see it because it's sitting back here on the organ behind me. That mirror was made by Thad Brindle way back when we used to meet downtown in a whole different building because the organist needed to be able to see what was going on and it's still here for Eddie to keep up with what's happening. Shirley remembers that when she was a little girl, she used to go to the parsonage which was beside the church and there the pastor would instruct the children in what it meant to be a Christian. And she was baptized by Reverend James Potter in 1948. She remembers Sunday school teachers and VBS workers. She remembers being in Girl Scouts and singing in the choir. And tomorrow, I believe, is your 60th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary to you all. What wonderful examples. Yes, you can go ahead and give them applause. I think this week about Bob and Carolyn Dellinger. Several of you have called to me this week and said, tell the stories of Bob and Carolyn. They are so faithful to our church. They came here in 1961, which happens to be the year I was born. They lived just seven blocks down from the church off of Davy Avenue. They came and visited the First Baptist Church and they went home and prayed about it. And they came back the next week and they joined our church and they jumped right in. Bob has been our church treasurer. He's been a building of the, member of the building and grounds team. He was here when the educational building was built and he helped write all of the checks for that and keep up with those expenses. He's taught Sunday school. He's chaired the ushers. Uh, 
He helped when the pews were refurbished. He was here when we replaced 167 windows in our building. He's been over so many different jobs. Carolyn works still in our clothes closet, and she works on committees. Even today in his 90s, Bob Dellinger comes here two or three times a week. You don't see it because it's when you're not here, but he's over our medical equipment ministry. He's spraying down canes and walkers, making sure that they are sanitized and clean. He's giving out wheelchairs to folks who come and say, can First Baptist help me? I, I have this problem. I don't have money to buy this medical equipment. What a great example they have given us. Someone wrote me this week and said, hey, talk about Beth and Jimmy Webb. I remember them from when I was a kid, how they were always there for us. Beth grew up in this church, and when she and Jimmy got married, he was not a member for several years and until he was looking at his children one day and said, we've got to be a part of this all together. This family has been critical to the life of our church. I was talking to Beth this week, and she was telling me some stories of things that this church has done in the past. And one of the most exciting times, she said, was back when we used to do the Ladies Thursday that we've talked about bringing back. She got a call from Dr. Jack Causey, and Beth said, you know, when the pastor calls, what do you say? Dr. Causey called and said, we're starting this new ministry for women that's going to be this wonderful meal that we're going to have together, and we're going to have different folks come and speak to us or have entertainment. And what I want you to do is I want you to come and set this thing up and decorate it. And so Beth showed up with Susan, five weeks old, there in just a carrier. And she began to figure out how to make this thing happen. Mary Lib told her that, you know, when we did this before, back at another church, we used to fold the napkins into swans. <laughs> the women here tried and tried to get those swans to stand up, and they just didn't quite ever fly. But well, they bought some napkin rings, and it went on. Jimmy called one evening to check on Beth. She had been here late in the evening trying to set up for this event. And he said, honey, do you need me to bring the toothbrush down if you're just going to spend the night there? That's the kind of faithfulness that these members, just a few I've talked about this morning, but as you read down this list of our Jubilee folks we celebrate today, these stories could be shared over and over and over again. We need to tell these stories of faithfulness in the life of First Baptist Church. But even more, we need to tell the story of Scripture. It is the greatest story of all. It is a story that impacts our lives. And we need to know the Bible and the story of the Bible because the Bible is a love story. It starts in Genesis with creation. When God breathes forth life because God is love. And that love overflowed so that it might create and bring life. And God created the man and the woman and put them in that garden. And we all know the story how everything was wonderful for God had made it so. And unfortunately, part of the story of Scripture is a story of our failure. We can blame Eve all we want. But when we read the story about her wanting to be like God, wanting to make her own decisions, refusing to listen to God but going on her own way, we too know that that is our story for we are all sinners in need of God's grace. There are so many false stories in Scripture. Cain, who slew his brother, the people who gathered together and said, we want to be like God, and they tried to build a tower up to God, and God tore it down. The people of the day of Noah, who were so corrupt that God said, I'm finished, and I'm going to flood the earth. But Noah was faithful, and God preserved the people. In fact, God looked down, and God said, I love this earth 
And I love humanity so much that I am going to choose a people that might be my people. And he found a man named Abram. And he said, your name is now Abraham, and I'm going to make a covenant with you. You will be my people, and I will be your God. I will bless you so that you might be a blessing to all people. Through you, people will know that there is a God. And we know the story of the patriarchs and matriarchs, how they tried to follow God and how they too failed often. And yet God kept faithful to this covenant. We know how the people of God ended up down in Egypt. First, as Joseph went down, sold into slavery, but rose up to be a ruler of Egypt. And then the people came, and God cared for them, but they fell into slavery themselves. And God heard their cries. Our children this week in vacation Bible school have been studying about this great adventure of the people of God. When God sent Moses and said, go and get my people, I will not let this stand and led them out through the sea and into the desert and gave them the law that they might learn how to live faithfully before God and in community with one another. And yet the people fell again. And so as we read on through Scripture, we read about great men and women known as prophets who rose up when the people of God were not following God's way and they would say, you have failed and God is not happy with this. Repent and turn unto God. They would say things like this. Obedience is more important than sacrifice. You can sacrifice all you want, but what God wants is an obedient and a faithful heart. They would remind the people that justice must flow down like mighty rivers. They would remind the people that God cares for the least of these, the poor and the downtrodden, and how we treat one another, especially those who are on the edge of society, shows whether or not we have heard the words of God. But the people would not listen to the prophets so God, in God's great timing, sent to us a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest in this story called the Bible. You know the story how Jesus is born into a humble stable. The child of a servant girl. The story is told in our stained glass from the Annunciation of Mary, to the birth of Jesus, to the ministry of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, all the way around, if you follow to the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, our stained glass tells the story of the gospel of Christ. His death, his burial, but thanks God, his resurrection. His coming back to life that through his death we might receive forgiveness of sin and through his resurrection that we might have life eternal for he has overcome death. And then the stained glass continues with the story of the ascension and of Pentecost, the birth of the church. And as we read through Scripture, we find that we are called to be the people of God in our time and in our place. This is not just a story of Scripture. This is our story. This is how we are to live. And the Bible concludes by reminding us that God will prevail because God will be victorious in the end. That Jesus one day will return and that those who are still here will be called up into glory. And if we do not last until that time, our glory will come as we pass from this life on into heaven. If we have believed on Christ and received his forgiveness and his salvation. That is the story of scripture in a nutshell. 
What is your favorite Bible story? When I was a kid, if you would ask me that story, I used to always quickly say, it's Paul and the shipwreck. You remember the story when Paul is bound and the ship comes upon a storm and it's cast upon the rocks and it breaks up and everyone safely gets to shore despite being chained down because of God's grace. And they light this fire. Do you remember that story? Paul's bit by a snake, a very poisonous snake, and he shakes it off into the fire. That's why I loved that story when I was a kid. It, it just seemed like such adventure. And everybody watches to see if Paul's going to die. And God's grace prevails. And not only does he live, but he begins to share the story of Jesus and of Christ's salvation. That's a great story filled with adventure. For a young man, I loved it. But if you were to ask me today, what is your favorite Bible story? I would have to say it is when the women go to the tomb. They go to the tomb with tears of grief because Jesus, whom they had followed, had been crucified and was dead. And all hope seemed gone. On the way, they wonder, how can we roll away the stone? You know the story. They get there, and the stone has been rolled away. And there are angels that say, stop your weeping, for he is not here. He is risen. Go and tell all he has come back to life. Why is my favorite story that story? Because it is the hope of the gospel. The resurrection of the dead. Today we celebrate Jubilee Sunday and we hear those great stories of those in our church who have been with us for so long. And we remember that their story is also the gospel story. They share these stories with us, not just to tell us about their lives, they share these stories with us to motivate us that we too might follow Christ. That we might develop our own stories. My friend Mike Queen, who used to be pastor of First Baptist Church in Wilmington, has written a book called Hopeful Imagination. I've been doing a Zoom meeting with him and some other pastors where he's going through this book and talking about the story of First Baptist Church Wilmington. When he went there to be pastor years ago, this church was struggling. It was a downtown church, downtown Wilmington, with only a handful of parking spaces. You had to want to go to that church because you had to park on the street somewhere and walk for blocks. Mike said that there was a building across the street. It was an old jail. It had a parking deck. They had had a prison ministry there for some time, and they, they knew about that building. And they built a new jail in that community, and it was deserted. Mike said he had a vision. If we could get that old jail, we could have that parking deck, and it might solve some of our parking problems down there. And he began to talk to his members about how they might do that. And as he was talking to one man, the fellow looked down and said, Dr. Queen, why do we just want the parking deck? What about that old building? What might God use it for? That place where people have been locked up for their crimes. Could it become a place where people find God's grace and new life. Mike told him that that building was old and that it probably just needed to be torn down. And he said, how do you know that? Have we looked at it? And they got an architect and they began to look at that and a new vision arose in that church that they would buy that building not just for the parking but that they might create a ministry center for the community a place where people could come and find help and hope. Word spread about this new ministry center that the church was trying to create. 
And the community rose up in opposition. Folks didn't want a place that might have homeless folks hanging out even more. The county commissioners received the bid from the church and they opened it up for an upset bid. The upset bid was too late. It was just a few dollars more, but the church got the bid and yet the county commissioners refused to sell the building to the church for politics. In the midst of all of that, Mike thought, what's going to happen to this dream? The church didn't want to sue the county. They didn't know what to do. And he got a call from a lady named Miss Evelina. Miss Evelina was an African-American woman who had heard about First Baptist Church's desire to create a ministry center. And she said, would you come to my prayer group, which meets on Thursday mornings at my house and let us pray for you and for your church. <laughs> Mike thought, I don't know this woman. I don't know if I have time. But he felt the leading of God, so he went. He opened the door to that house, and it was filled with women who had already begun to pray and were singing. They brought him in, and they cleared the seat, and they set him down there, and they surrounded him, and they put their hands on him, and they said, Lord, help this boy. <laughs> Mike, who was at the time pushing 50. Lord, help this boy. Help this church. Provide this ministry. Mike went away, and a few weeks later, Miss Evelina called again and said, you're going to get that old jail. And he said, yes, I hope we are. He said, she said, no, Mike, you're not listening to me. You're going to get that jail. God has told me so. That afternoon, the county relented and decided to go ahead and execute the contract. First Baptist Church had offered a million dollars for that building. And they had no idea exactly how they had raised it, and now they had to have it. They began to pray again, and Miss Evelina called again and said, Brother Mike, you're going to get that money from one person. He said, no, we're going to have to have a, a, a big capital campaign. And you know what? She said, no, Brother Mike, God's spoken to me in our group, and you're going to get that money. Not long after that, a man named Bobby Harrelson said, Mike, can we have lunch? I want to talk to you. As they sat down for lunch, Bobby said, you remember Joanne, who we lost this past year, Joanne and I pray many times that our church might be able to buy that building and have a ministry center. And on her deathbed, she made me promise that we would give the money for that ministry center. And then he handed him the check. These are stories of the faithfulness of God. Stories that can happen right here in Statesville as well. If God's people will pray and be faithful in the midst of the most difficult times perhaps that we have faced when we can't even come together as a church fully and be together in the same room, God's spirit is still moving. Mike said to us this past week after sharing that story, he said, if you think the best days of your church are behind you, then they are. But if you think that the best days of your church are before you, they are as well. For the Spirit of God is still acting. Why do we celebrate Jubilee Sunday and hear these stories? So that we might remember God's faithfulness through the years, yes. But even more so that we might take these stories and say, if God was faithful to us before, God can be faithful to us today and in the future. Why does Paul write to young Timothy and say, remember your grandmother and your mother, their faithfulness? Because Paul turns around in verse 6 and says, for this reason I remind you of them. So that you might fan the flame of the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. 
these stories are not just for us to think about the past. They are to remind us to rekindle the flame that is in our own heart and mind. I love the story that Paul shared about coming to the church when it was down there and it had an old coal furnace and somebody needed to light the fire. And he and his daddy did it. I used to live on the Brushy Mountains. My favorite thing about that house was that it had a wood stove. And in the evening, I could put several logs in there. I could load the stove and close the door and turn the vents down and it would burn all night long. But in the morning, I had to get up and do something. I had to open the vents that air might come back in there and I had to open the door and look in there and in that stove would be some embers still burning. And I'd take a paper plate and I'd fan some air in there to get oxygen to those embers. And I'd put little pieces of kindling in there and they would begin to flame. And then I would put more logs in and the flame would rise once again and warm the house. The church is here that we might provide the light of Christ's salvation and the warmth of the grace of God to the community where God has placed us here in this time. And the message this morning isn't just about some old stories. It's about hearing those stories and letting the oxygen, the Holy Spirit, come into our hearts and our minds. About opening ourselves to the presence of the Holy Spirit. About through prayer and meditation, through reading the scriptures once again, allowing God to relight those flames that can burn in us today and be a beacon of light and hope for our community. We are like young Timothy. We have a heritage of faith, but we have a future of mission before us. We come now to our time of commitment, a time that we do a little bit differently. I used to stand before you and you could come down and we could talk. I can't do that. We have to be safe and stay a little bit away from one another. But I am here and I am your pastor. I invite you, if God is moving in your life, to give me a call this week, and we will find a way to share that commitment with our church. We've already had those join our church, even though we had to do it without them present back before we could even have anyone here. And maybe there are those in our community that want to be a part of First Baptist. Give us a call and let me welcome you into the life of our church. We also have our prayer bench here. You are always welcome to come and pray. Just keep a little bit apart. If God is speaking to you, though, I invite you to make a commitment in this time of dedication.